Hey, Sleepy Sheepy here. Today we're going to be looking at a level 70 poison dexterity build, and this is going to be showcasing two poison roomies. We'll be putting 40 points into vigor, 25 into endurance, and then 40 into dexterity, and that should fill up our entire level pool. And we're going to be running the Mushroom Crown, which does give us a bonus when we proc poison, as well as the Tree Sentinel Armor and then the Crucible Gauntlets and Greaves. We'll also use the Erd Tree's Favor plus 2 for HP, Stamina, and Equip Load boosts. Uh, the Bulgoat Talisman, which brings us to 101 Poise. The Kindred Rot's Exaltation Talisman, which will also give us a boost in AR when we proc poison. And then Millicent's Prosthesis, which boosts our dexterity by 5 points, as well as giving us uh, extra attack power with successive attacks. I did switch this up a little bit. This could also be the Claw Talisman, since the jump attack is really strong. Or you could use the Rotten Wing Sword Insignia Talisman, which does something similar as uh, Millicent's Prosthesis, but doesn't give you the five extra points in dexterity, so I opted for Millicent's Prosthesis. The dual whip setup isn't really great for chase down, so I did put on a Lightning Godskin Stitcher, so that is a potential option if you want to go for chase downs a little bit more effectively. I also did put a Missouri Corde and a Parry Shield on this build just for crits. It's worth noting that whips cannot perform uh, critical attacks, so you can't get backstabs or reposts with whips. I use the Dexterity Knot tier and the Crimson Bubble tier. Neither of these are really necessary for this build. I would say there are a lot of options you could use, so uh, the Leaden Hard tier might be nice just because you don't have a ton of poise damage with most of the moveset for the whips, or you could use the Thorny Crack tier to make successive attacks grow stronger, which is also nice because you'll frequently get in a lot of quick attacks with the whips. There are a couple different Ashes of War that I used throughout this showcase, so one was Bloodhound Step, which was mostly just used in instances if I was going to be using Iron Jar Aromatic. The next is going to be Raptors of the Mist, which is great for landing jumping attacks, so I definitely recommend using the Claw Talisman with this if you're going to be using it. I also used Beast Roar a little bit, which was pretty solid as just a way to add some chip damage. That might be good for an offhand Ash of War. Uh, I tried Storm Stomp as well, and that was not bad, but I think I preferred Raptors of the Mist. And then Royal Knight's Resolve, I kept on my offhand whip just as a way to buff a jumping attack before a fight started. I didn't really incorporate it a ton throughout Invasions, and I think putting Beast Roar on your offhand might make more sense in Royal Knight's Resolve. The moveset for this build is going to be pretty solid, uh, especially in one-on-one -on -one situations. You have jumping attacks that come out quick and do a lot of damage, especially with the Claw Talisman. You have a unique heavy that comes out in two parts if it's fully charged, so uncharged it just looks like this, but fully charged you get the slash and then the kind of long point. So. That adds a lot of range and can be really nice for roll catching people, uh, especially if they dodge the first part, they might get hit by the second, which is pretty nice. Um, just the standard L1 from neutral is not too bad. It comes out pretty quick. It doesn't have as much range as say like the fully charged heavy, but it's pretty solid. The crouching light attack has a little bit more range as well and is pretty quick. So that's a good one to be aware of. And I think when you're using dual whip setups, you can kind of forget about it. So just a good one to note. Um, and the regular light attack is, I don't know. I, I wouldn't use it too much. I think the just neutral L1 is gonna be better in most cases than the regular light attack or the crouching um, light attack is gonna come out a little bit faster. So I'd recommend Mostly the, the jumping heavies with the dual whip setup, uh, the crouching light attack, the fully charged heavy, and yeah, and occasionally a neutral L1. The main strategy we're going to be going for is to proc poison and then try to get off as much damage as quickly as possible once the poison's been procced, since our AR is going to be boosted. And especially if we can get some either jumping attacks or successive attacks, depending on the setup that we've got, will want to take advantage of that. So what's nice about the Millicent's Prosthesis or Rotten Winged Sword Insignia is that you don't need to wait for the poison uh, to get an AR boost. If you're pressuring a lot and getting a lot of quick hits in, you're going to get that AR boost pretty quickly. Um, but the jumping attacks are extremely solid. So if you need more of a burst damage situation, I would say using the Claw Talisman is going to be pretty helpful, especially once you've procced poison. 
that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to say about the build and the moveset we're going to be using. So if you want to go ahead and skip ahead to the invasions, feel free. I did want to mention, however, that I'm trying to hit a goal of 1,000 subscribers. Um, I've been mentioning this in some of my videos, so uh, if you've already heard this, please bear with me. Um, but if you wouldn't mind subscribing, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, once I hit 1,000, I can get some money back from YouTube. So that's kind of the goal here. But um, yeah, let's just go ahead and jump into the invasions. All right, so jumping into our first invasion here, I am going to be using Iron Jar Aromatic in this 3v1. and going to be after uh, one phantom dies, but I think it's kind of been a theme at least to start these videos using Iron Jar Aromatic with whatever build uh, I'm running, so I thought I'd give it another try here. And I have Bloodhound Step on this, which is going to help with the mobility issue that comes with Iron Jar Aromatic, but uh, I would say the dual whip setups are nice in context of using it because they have extra range, so that's pretty useful in terms of reaching your opponent when your movement is slow, but they have really low poise damage, which means you're not necessarily likely to stop your opponent from attacking you. So in 3v1 situations, I found where I could poise break multiple opponents at once and just get in a bunch of hits. With the whip setup, they would all be able to continue to attack me, even though um, maybe the recovery times were a little bit slower, so I would say for a whip setup, it's not actually great, but it is fun to use and can be useful in certain circumstances. Uh, next up we have a 3v1, and this one was pretty interesting. I did the math after uh, this was over, and one of these phantoms is running a build that's around level 500, so uh, always scary. You can see there I get hit with their hammers, and they just do so much damage um, compared to, you know, what hammers typically do. And I think they land their Ash of War once or twice and you can see it just like chunks me so uh that was a little bit scary but it also is a good way to demonstrate that this build is actually viable in 3v1s when you're facing at least one overleveled phantom so i almost die there and i really have to back off uh kind of the trick when facing um america's hammer which i believe is a weapon that the overleveled phantom is using uh that particular ash of war just comes out later than i think is natural to expect so if you can really delay your roll until the very end of that kind of slam down with the hammer um, you'll most likely dodge the full damage from it but like right there I dodged early and especially because the timing of it varies depending on how far away they are from you it can really be difficult to get the hang of but I do manage to get this down to a 2v1 and I'm a little bit more confident uh, we still have the overleveled phantom and the host is using like a sword and board setup, which is giving me some space. It's not great for aggressing. They also go for like multiple swings in the same spot. So um, really the overleveled phantom is the one that I need to be worried about. I do go for a talisman swap there that did result in some damage, but now I'm going for more jump attacks and I'm able to land a, a jump attack and then get a couple follow-up quick hits after proccing poison on the overleveled phantom. And you can see there I get uh, just a bunch of runes and that's kind of uh, the signif signifier that uh, that phantom was very overleveled. And then once it's just a one-on-one -on -one with the host, it's really no problem. But um, I would say, you know, it's just a good way to show that this build is somewhat viable in PvP, even against some people that are, are overleveled. Um, like, if you have three people with cross Naginatas, I'm not sure it's going to do that well, but uh, you can still have fun with it and win some invasions, even when some of the odds are kind of stacked against you. Next up, we have another 3v1, and <laughs> this was a pretty rough gank setup where we have lots of Dragon Breath and then the Black Blade Ash of War, which does a ton of damage. So I try to get in and out as quickly as possible um, and just get off some damage while the elevator is going down. Um, there was also some weird issue with like the player model desyncing and kind of disappearing for a second, um, but I am able to just continuously roll catch this phantom with the jumping attack. Uh, after I landed the first two, I kind of figured if it ain't broke, don't fix it type thing. Um, the phantom goes up and then I come back up and use Iron Jar Aromatic. However, the host severs out the phantom and that just kind of turns it into a one-on-one -on -one situation. They try to use Dragon Breath again, because 
Uh, I'm not sure why, uh, but definitely wasn't the play there, and they kind of just stood there and received all the whip hits, but um, just a kind of successful dispatch of the, the full gank. Um, this next one I thought was kind of funny. Um, this one's a little bit longer, and we'll be switching up our build throughout, but it starts off as kind of a honorable one-on-one -on -one situation with me versus the Phantom. They're using an interesting setup. They have the Beastman Greatsword, um, or Curve Greatsword, I forget which, um, and an offstock with uh, Frost buildup. So pretty cool. I definitely liked uh, kind of the variety. I mean, the offstock is nothing like totally new, but um, I just thought it was kind of fun. And then I'm, you know, going for jumping attacks. I do proc poison, and that's kind of shifts the the fight in my direction. But we definitely kind of kept it honorable. Um, nobody healed throughout this. I mean, it's an invasion, so really anything goes. But um, I was definitely enjoying that. And we do have a, a phantom and a host kind of standing off to the to the other side there, just watching. So I think they were expecting for me to lose, and but I do manage to get in a jumping attack, and then a uh, charged heavy there for the win and immediately the <laughs> phantom starts trying to kill me with lightning so uh that rubbed me the wrong way i would say like you know totally they can do whatever they want but it wasn't like within the spirit of what was going on i would say so um they start going after me and the host is now just watching i'm a little bit suspicious here they go for the rivers of blood attack um one thing i did find was that uh, letting your opponent attack you and then going for uh, just a straight jump so not like a jump forward or a jump back and the L1 was pretty nice um, in terms of landing your jumping L1 um, the, the you'll, they'll usually assume that you're going to go forward and kind of space according to that and if you just jump straight up they'll usually miss their attack and you'll be able to land your jumping L1. So I think the host sees that it's not really going well for the Phantom, so they start sending some magic spells my way, and uh, <laughs> then the Phantom starts to heal, so I give them a, a little quick clap just to kind of let them know how much I appreciate their playstyle here. Um, so they are trying to chase me down. They're not super effective at it, and here I decide that I'm going to change up my build a little bit. Um, with the added pressure of the magic coming my way, I think that using the Godskin Stitcher might be a little bit more appropriate. Um, at this point, I've kind of invested a decent amount of time, so I'm a little less keen to lose, I would say. And I also just feel like the, the dual whip setup is not great um, if you have magic spam coming your way because you end up being somewhat stationary for a little while. So the Phantom kind of backs off with pressure and the host continues to use magic. So I at least go towards them, um, get an idea of what their build is when they switch to the Moon Veil. Um, so I wasn't really intending on killing the fan or the host, but I did want to apply a little bit of pressure and just you know kind of remind them that they aren't going to be able to just stand there and cast spells without any sort of repercussions. Um, I do land a couple good hits on the Phantom and what was nice about the first part is that I didn't heal at all, so I have a decent amount of heals throughout the course of this. Um, the host is now getting a little bit more aggressive with the Moon Veil, and I'm just trying to, you know, kind of really pick my moments in terms of when to attack with the, the Stitcher. It's a, just a great weapon in general for uh, finding quick openings and then using the fairly quick recovery time to get out of a bad spot. And then when people become really aggressive, you can kind of just spam light attacks and stay in the same spot, and they'll usually just get continuously poise broken. So um, it definitely felt like the right tool for the job here. That was actually a really good moment from the host there to just kind of free aim the um, spell into the ground and hit me with kind of the splash damage from it. I'm not sure if it was intentional or not, but it ended up being pretty useful, and the Phantom did a good job of kind of drawing me in. So now things are when it gets a little bit dicey. Um, I start getting hit by more spells, and each one does close to half my HP. Um, I still have a decent amount of health, and I think that is what ends up being like ultimately kind of discouraging for this duo. Um, and at this point... I'm not sure if it's been clarified that the the phantom doesn't have any health left but um 
at some point they they did go for two heels and i think the only the first one um connected and they got the animation where like they were out of fastest so um yeah at this point they realize that things aren't going their way and just decide to jump off a cliff uh, i guess they were out of heels and didn't want to get killed um so very honorable there but it does get me some more health and at this point, I'm kind of just like, I would like to finish this in style if I can. So I will switch over to uh, a whip in my main hand and a parry shield in my off hand. And I think this is probably a good opportunity to see if I can parry Moonvale. Um, so here I do get the parry and then get the hard swap to the Misericorde for the finish, which uh, after a long invasion, like not whiffing any parries and being able to, to hard swap over to a Misericorde before the, the repost, uh, it, it just like felt pretty good. Um, so it wasn't a perfect showcase, I guess, of this build exactly, but it was just kind of a fun invasion that I wanted to include. Um, next up we have a 2v1, and this can kind of show just how useful the roll catch timing can be if you have a player that is not familiar with the whip timing so i would say for chase downs whips are pretty solid if you have an opponent that doesn't know the timing but if they do know the timing they're kind of predictable um, which is why i did put a god skin stitcher on this build uh, so that first phantom just like kind of was off on the back foot there and didn't really get out of the initial pressure that i applied and the host wasn't good at um kind of diverting my attention so i'm able to get in some jumping attacks there and i also go for a couple of fully charged heavies um, and that last fully charged heavy there was enough to just kind of catch them midair and finish off the damage so that one um was, was just a kind of quick and easy 2v1 um, that was a lot of fun and then next up we have a it starts as a 2v1 i believe a blue comes in afterwards but uh i switch over to the parry shield with carrying retaliation just to kind of discourage some magic spell spam coming my way um, it doesn't totally work in terms of a psychological tactic but it did add some damage to the phantom there and it's also a, a not a bad way to showcase just the one whip setup which isn't bad um i like the heavy attacks a lot uh charged or uncharged the fully charged one is nice uh in one-on-one -on -one situations i would say but two-on-one -on -one situations um just the uncharged heavy has a kind of a wide sweeping range to it and is really nice for connecting on multiple opponents at the same time so that ended up um being kind of a useful tactic with that phantom and then we have the host uh, just kind of running away here and i do manage to proc poison which has been a it's always just a nice pressuring tool i would say um like rot is going to be a little bit stronger deadly poison is going to be a little bit stronger but uh, i definitely did have some moments where the the poison was kind of the factor that ended the fight for at least one of my opponents and it, it's nice to you know you might not be that up and close and personal, but if if they're really low on health and they have poison buildup, then you don't have to connect a hit with them during uh, the chase down. As long as you don't let them heal, uh, you'll usually be able to whittle them down. So I'm a big fan of poison builds. Uh, like <laughs> I don't think they're ever going to be meta, but I, I would say that they're just really fun to use, and I would love to see you know potential DLC content provide more poison stuff uh, especially more deadly poison stuff i think that'd be great um i did get um another serpent bone blade so i now have two um i made a build in the past using it uh just using one which i do think is effective but now that i have two i might make another build video just related to that um definitely let me know in the comments if that's something you're interested in um but i have done a fair amount of poison content recently so i do like to vary it up um this next invasion is a 3v1, and I think it's a good demonstration of using Royal Knight's Resolve as well as Raptors of the Mist. Um, I That was probably my favorite setup that I used in terms of Ashes of War. Um, I thought Raptors of the Mist really complemented the jumping attack, and um, Royal Knight's Resolve was great if you, know, you could buff your offhand with royal knight's resolve and then try to a pressure apply pressure with your main hand just going for light attack so that means that the royal knight's resolve wouldn't be applied or wouldn't be applied in a attack per se um and then once you bait your opponent into an attack you can 
go for a Raptors of the Mist and then get the jumping attack with the Royal Under Knights Resolve. So, um, you know, that has to kind of happen pretty quickly, but if you are able to get it off, it's uh, a good way to just get out a lot of damage, especially if you've already applied um, your poison. So here was a moment when I was going for the chase down, they had poison procced, and uh, I didn't even have to hit them, it just was enough to kill them. And that turned this from a kind of scary 2v1 into a very manageable one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so here you can see I'm, I'm doing what I'm talking about. I'm trying to bait attacks with my um, right hand, and then I have Royal Knights Resolved applied with my left, and I wait until the opponent attacks, and I get off Raptors of the Mist, and then go for a jumping attack with the Royal Knights Resolve still applied. So um, that was kind of the, the main tactic here that I was going for, and I found it to be pretty effective. You could get a pretty significant amount of damage with a jumping attack using the Claw Talisman, the Poison buff, and Royal Knights Resolve kind of all applied at the same time. So um, yeah, just a, a setup that I really enjoyed, um, probably more than like Beast's Roar or Bloodhound Step. I've never really used Bloodhound Step um, too often. Uh, it kind of had the reputation at the beginning of Elden Ring that it was overpowered, so it never really made it into my repertoire. And then I just, I really enjoyed um, Quick Step, mostly because of the Quick Step backstabs. So, um, you know, Bloodhound Step, I would say, is more balanced than it used to be, um, but I kind of just stuck with Quick Step after a certain point in Elden Ring. And, um, I think it would be useful to use Bloodhound Step in some scenarios, uh, especially like high level PvP, like it's pretty much necessary in some situations, but for me it's just never really been a big part of my play style. Um, so I don't think it's, you know, bad to use it or anything at this point. Um, it's been balanced somewhat well, especially with the um, kind of change to how spammable it is. Now you don't get like as far of range on um, how far you go with the, your Bloodhound steps if you are um, just kind of spamming it too much. So it, your range decreases and everything, which makes it a little bit more viable and the iframes are no longer as significant. So um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure where I stand on it. I might try it in more builds, but uh, for me just, you know, rolling and quick step is uh, the uh, kind of iframes that I go for. Um, so that's kind of a long tangent there about just like where I feel Bloodhound Step falls into my play style. Um, I really don't enjoy it when it, it's, you know, like a heavy thrusting sword Bloodhound Step user um, to play against. It's just kind of, I don't know, uh, a very spammy style of playing and you know, you can play however you want, but it's just not one that I like to fight against. And typically if it's a, a type of build that I don't like to fight against, I don't play it myself that much. Um, but that is to say that it, it is a good way to learn, you know, just trying out builds that you don't like or builds that you struggle against, because once you've tried them out, it can be really effective to um, just kind of know the play style associated with it, even if you don't like it, um, you'll, you'll know how to counter it better. So um, maybe something I should give some more love in the future too, but for now, I just kind of, you know, I, I had more fun with Raptors in the Mist, I would say, and, uh, some of the other attacks. Beast Roar was, was not so bad, um, but I, I guess rips, whips have a lot of range, so there are some scenarios where Beast Roar is, is pretty useful, but they're not as frequent as Raptors of the Mist. I would say a lot of moments came up where Raptors of the Mist was pretty helpful and moments where Beast Roar was helpful were kind of few and far between. So um, not super necessary there. And then Royal Knights Resolve on the offhand is, is pretty solid if you remember to use it. I found it uh, fairly difficult if I, you know, was playing for a little while and then put the game down and then came back to it um, just to remember to use it. Um, so you also need a little bit of extra space to get the buff going. So it's not impossible with the play style, but it's, you know, offhand Ashes of War aren't amazing um, if they're requiring time and don't add innate pressure to them. Uh, if I had set this up a little bit differently, if I wasn't going for a poison build, I definitely would have put um, the Lightning Strike Ash of War in my offhand just because it's a great way to get people to kind of 
come towards you and bait them into attacking you and then it's also great for uh chase downs just because you can stay stationary and you get the extra range that comes with the lightning strike ash of war so uh had this not been a poison build that's the way i would have gone and i think that's not a uh, uncommon way to set up whip builds is just with lightning strike in your offhand especially because it's a dexterity build so you get the extra scaling associated with lightning if you want to go for uh lightning whips so that's just kind of a, a a thought about different ashes of war on these builds and next up we do have a one-on-one -on -one, which i don't frequently put in um this person's setup wasn't a great counter to whips uh i would say having something that's long and pokey is going to be slightly better so uh you know like a lance or some sort of halberd is going to be better than something that swings with shorter range um, but this person was doing definitely a, a good job i think the area that we were at this incline was much more conducive to whip use than their weapons um the hitbox for whips has more verticality than some other weapons um so like a i don't know heavy thrusting sword might not have done that well here but whips i think really shine and i'm able to utilize the um uh, raptors of the mist to get off a couple good jumping attacks and just kind of navigate the area uh, a decent a decent amount to get off you know all the chip damage that i need um that was something i also found about this build to be kind of interesting is that the fights lasted uh, a decent amount longer with this whip build just because chip damage is so integral in this setup you really have uh you know moments where you get burst damage off with like jumping attacks but especially with poison you know waiting out your opponents and letting that poison build up kind of take down your opponent's hp is going to be really helpful this next 2v1 that turns into a 3v1 i would say is a good example of that where we have uh one phantom that kind of draws my attention throughout the course of this invasion uh this one with the twin blade here i do a decent job of getting them down to a pretty low health um but they use regen while i have poison applied which i'm not sure if it canceled out completely but it was something that I kind of was keeping my eye on, and it was actually, when they are low health, I think you can get tunnel vision. Um, so that, that's something to be aware of, too, is, uh, you know, kind of regrouping and figuring out a different strategy if somebody's low health, especially if you suspect that they're out of health or heals. Um, it can be nice to just kind of regroup and not assume that you're going to uh, be able to chase them down immediately because your extra aggression that you'll use when trying to chase them down can be punished um, pretty effectively in some cases. Uh, the nice thing about this particular invasion was that the host and the blue weren't super heavy in terms of their damage output. Uh, so the, the twin blade user I'd say was definitely the biggest challenge and I was able to get poison off I think maybe pretty soon here. Um, and that is a moment when you can see their regen is now procced and they are kind of staying back so uh the, the two are kind of canceling out but i really want to chase down this um phantom here and i think in just a moment here i'll, I'll get a backstab because of it because I, I really go for the chase down they seem to have a decent amount of uh understanding of just kind of the timing associated with whips especially the jumping attack so um there I get backstabbed because I'm just going after this phantom and it's just kind of something I'm working on is avoiding having tunnel vision in scenarios like this but I am able to get them to bloodhound step off the the tree there and then land a jumping attack on my way down um, just kind of utilizing the lack of vertical vision that they have and once it's just a 2v1 I almost get blundered here with the the blood loss buildup and the the blue is not you doing a ton of damage but they are um, setting up their sword with blood loss so it's a little bit scary from that perspective uh, but the the damage output is not so bad so I just need to kind of keep an eye on my blood loss meter and make sure that it doesn't get procced again or that I roll it or use um, Raptors of the Mist so uh, this was also an interesting invasion from Raptors of the Mist kind of timing you really have to be sure that your opponent is about to connect with you right when you use it it's not that difficult to miss time raptors of the mist and just get hit if your opponent delays their attack so i would say uh if an opponent is going for light attacks and then they switch it up to a heavy attack which has a slower startup time and 
you kind of go for Raptors of the Mist right before their heavy attack, thinking it's going to be a light attack, you'll often get hit by that attack um, and still be kind of in that animation. So just it comes out extremely fast. So if you can really delay it, I would say that's going to be the most effective way to use it. Um, it's also kind of a nice counter to shield builds because they're going to be in their attack animation. And depending on what they have, um, you know, they may or may not hit you with multiple attacks and that can knock you out of the air. But if they have a slower weapon and they're kind of guarding a lot, then Raptors of the Mist can be a nice way to just kind of take care of, of that opponent. Um, this next invasion is kind of a long one and was really interesting from a lag perspective. This player had um, perfect timing with the damage output they were doing on me, but I had like maybe close to a 10 second delay with all the damage output that I was hitting on them. And so what they were able to do was just kind of put up their shield um, after they went for a few attacks and then block any damage that comes their way. So uh, just kind of keep an eye on when my hits land um, versus what's going on physically. Um, and then where their hits land and how much damage it does. So this was just, uh, this was at the end of a 3v1, but the whole thing ended up being about 15 full minutes. So I just cut it to the end. Uh, Cause this was like one where I really had to think about how I could manage this. They also have poison and blood buildup with um, the Nabakiba. So, um, or Naginata, sorry. Um, it, it was just a really weird moment where their lag was consistently bad. I'm not sure if it was something they were doing on purpose um, or if it was just a really weird connection, but you could see my hits, you know, they come so late. And if my opponent just puts up their shield, you know, like 10 seconds after I land a hit, they'll block it. Um, so that was really interesting. And I kind of, you know, back off a little bit, try to reassess the right way to go. I think I'm also out of health or out of heals rather. So I just needed to like think about this for a little while. I also will like be talisman swapping and putting on regen just because, you know, after like 10 ish minutes of fighting to lose to like a really packet lossy shield poker, um, it was like not something I was super interested in doing. So uh, here we can kind of see, I'm just seeing if the packet loss is going to change at all. So sometimes I, I've found that if you are fighting somebody that's packet lossy, uh, after a period of time, it, it'll get better. Um, but this was pretty consistent with the timing. It was like exactly 10 seconds after uh, I'd land a hit, the, the damage would show up. So... Um, it, it was very interesting to fight against. I do go for a parry there, and then I remove my shield because I want to go for a kick. Um, they do put on the buff to their, their great shield, like <laughs> as if their, their setup wasn't um, strong enough already. So I, I'm just like, okay, I'm not dealing with this on the tree anymore. I need to figure out a different strategy. Um, I do use some blue juice and kind of get chased down a little bit here. Um, I want to get more regen going. They get kind of distracted by a dog. I try to get in a hit or two. Um, you can see some latency with that attack there. Um, and I, I just start backing off because I'm, I'm not really sure what to do. Um, you'll kind of see this play out here. But this might be a good time to just kind of summarize this build in general. I, I like the whips for sure. I would say one-on-one -on -one situations, it may be possible to like win a whole bunch of duels with this setup. There are moments where, you know, you can kind of combine different aspects of the build, uh, the jump attacks, the poison procs, um, or successive attacks. Like there were almost too many different talismans that would have worked well for this build for me to choose. And that's why I kind of swapped around between different setups. Um, one-on-ones, I would say it's totally viable, but where it kind of struggles is multiple aggressive opponents. Um, having multiple aggressive opponents can be pretty difficult, especially because you're not doing very much poise damage. So uh, not being able to stun lock your opponents and just kind of slow down the fight makes whips pretty pretty difficult to use, I would say, in, in multiple opponent situations and that's why I went for so many jump attacks which have decent range and kind of a, a wide hitbox and also do a good amount of poise damage some of the most poise damage you're going to get out of the dual whip setup so uh, 
I don't know, you're going to rely probably pretty heavy, heavily on the jumping attacks. And because of that, it's not necessarily super difficult to use this build, but there are certain ways to counter it in a group setting that's going to be really effective. So uh, it's definitely an interesting build. It's not going to be great for meta, but it may be pretty viable for dual setups, which... Um, that's also something I'm interested in knowing is if you are interested in seeing more duels with the builds that I run, let me know. I feel like invasions are, are pretty fun. Um, in the past, I had done you know a, a section that was dual showcases and also invasion showcases, but um, after patch, I think 1.06, when we got the ability to invade everywhere, invasions were much more consistent, so I didn't really feel the need to be dueling too often. Um, so... I don't know, that's just some feedback I'd love to get from the community if um, anybody cares to see duels. Um, if there's a, a strong interest in it, I'd definitely be happy to know. But um, at least for now, it can be difficult to get duels on PlayStation if you're not at level 125. Um, I think a lot of people that were dueling at, you know, say 80 or 100 stopped when we could invade everywhere because most people were just sick of looking for invasions and switched to uh, looking for duels just if they couldn't find invasions. But now that they're so consistent with uh, pretty much most level ranges, it's uh, not a bad place to be. Um, so we're pretty close to the end of this invasion. And I do switch over to a Viper Bite setup. I figure that poison damage is going to, you know, once it's procced, it's going to be really effective in terms of hitting my opponent because nothing else that I've been doing has worked consistently. And Viper Bite is a great way to um, kind of do a decent amount of chip damage. And it's also really quick to proc. So even I knew that even if the hit was really delayed, um, it would likely proc the poison in one or two hits. So that ended up just applying enough pressure, and I don't know if they were out of heals or what their situation was, but they didn't really appreciate the amount of damage they were taking from Viper Bite, and it was uh, the way to win this one. If you made it this far, I just wanted to say thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate everybody you know, contributing to watch time, subscribing, liking, all that stuff. Um, it's really nice seeing this channel grow. I also wanted to give a shout out to Early Fishing from the Patches Emporium subreddit. Um, this person helped me out with getting some items duped and that's always helpful for making unique builds. So I should be able to use two unique weapons simultaneously, such as the Arumis here, which I only had one for a while just because it takes a long time to, to play through the game and this is uh, not on New Game Plus. So I just wanted to give a shout out there. And then I also wanted to say that this build was uh, specifically requested from the comment section of one of my previous videos. So if you do have suggestions or builds you'd like to see, I'm happy to give them a try. I had a lot of fun with this one and I really just, you know, appreciate people participating. So yeah, that's all I got to say. Thanks so much and have a good one.